Welcome to the Level Up Artist Podcast. We're your hosts, Adriana M.A. and Jackie Sanders. We are two art professionals sharing for the advice and business lessons we have learned along our creative journeys. We talk to artists, leaders, and art professionals to demystify the creative process and discover new ways to succeed as a career-minded artist. If you find value in these conversations, please go ahead and subscribe. This will help other creatives like you find our podcast and you'll be notified when we drop a new episode every Tuesday. On today's episode, we are so excited to welcome Jennifer Dossel to the podcast. Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you so much for having me. This is such a treat. I appreciate it. Absolutely. We're excited to discuss with you the origin of the Art Curious podcast, your journey as a creative professional, your advice on any time management as you balance uh, several creative projects, as well as recording a bonus segment on building your artist reputation for podcast supporters at leveluparts.com. But before we dive in, uh, we'd like to share with our listeners a little bit more about your background uh, for those who may not be familiar with you or with you, your book, your podcast, or the work you've done before. Yes. So Jennifer DeSalle is an art historian and is the creator and host of the Art Curious podcast, an internationally popular bi-weekly show exposing the unexpected, the slightly odd, and the strangely wonderful in art history. It was chosen as one of the PC Magazine's best podcasts of the year for four years in a row and was selected as one of the best history podcasts of 2019 by, oh, the Oprah magazine. (laughs) In September 2020, Jennifer's first book, Art Curious, Stories of the Unexpected, Slightly Odd, and Strangely Wonderful in Art History, was released by Penguin Books. The book has already received a much-coveted starred review from Publishers Weekly and was highlighted in page, book page, book list, and other publications. Yes, and I'm looking forward to the second book, but we'll talk about that a little bit later before we do a little bit more about Jennifer. Um, She's the former curator of modern and contemporary art at the North Carolina Museum of Art, where she worked for 13 years. She received her BFA BA in art history from the University of California at Davis and her MA in art history from the University of Notre Dame. And she has completed PhD coursework in art history at Pennsylvania State University. Prior to joining the NCMA in 2008, she worked in various curatorial roles at various institutions, including the University of Notre Dame and University of California. Today, Jennifer lives in Wendell, North Carolina, not too far from Raleigh, uh, with her husband, son, and apparently a very grouchy cat. <laughs> Very grouchy. It's a very (laughs) formal introduction, but are there any elements that you think that we missed? Maybe some elaboration on that grouchy cat of yours? (laughs) She, I feel like in recent months, I've been highlighting her just a little bit more on YouTube and, you know, the occasional reel on Instagram. But um, yeah, she, she is a benign, what would I try to say? She, she benignly ignores the entire family (laughs) at best. Um, and then at worst, it's like full out war. How dare you interrupt the relaxing time that I'm having sitting here in the middle of your desk or on the top of your laptop? It's like, how dare you? Yeah, I love that. It's She's very particular. World, you're just living in it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> very much so. It's the whole like, where is my dinner servant? It is time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She's, oh. she's a handful. I love her a lot. And she's a handful. <laughs> um. <laughs> Cat stories aside, which we love, of course, I have some myself. Um, we're definitely excited to dive into, you know, a lot of the things in your background. But first, like to take a step back, you know, in the time machine, so you will, if you will, and inquire, you know, about your background. So growing up, did you always know that you wanted to be involved in the arts? Absolutely not. <laughs> Not one bit. And this is something that I always tell people that if you were to, you know, have that time machine and approach little baby Jen and be like, you are going to grow up just immersed in the art world. And this is going to become your, your passion, your direction, what you do for a living. I would have said like, no way you're absolutely insane because this was not, this was not my plan. I am hugely, hugely thankful that this plan found me because this was not what I was looking for. No, I was always the kid with the rock collection and the obsession with dinosaurs. So until my junior year of college, I was a geology major. Uh, always like a science kid. I loved books. I loved reading. But we had no interest as a family in art. I don't think, it, with the exception of one very memorable trip to a museum in San Francisco to see a Monet exhibition that my mom dragged me and my dad with her to go see. There was no art museum time, no galleries, no nothing. 
it was not at all part of my family. The other problem was that we didn't have a lot of art education in schools. We still have a lack of art education in a lot of schools, but my school in particular, we had a teacher who would come in, I think when I was in like sixth or seventh grade, and she would come in about twice a month. And I tell the story because it seriously scarred me for so long <laughs> in that every single class, she began with something that she called the circle exercise. And to this day, I talk to a lot of teachers. No one has yet come to me to tell me that they do this or they've heard of it. So I, I don't know if it's specific to this lady, but what she would do is she would put five minutes on a timer. And she would say, you have five minutes. And in this five minutes, you will practice drawing a perfect circle. And perfect was the key word. It had to be as close to perfect as possible. You could erase as much as you wanted, but you couldn't use like a compass or, or any other materials. It was just freehand drawing. And this is the worst part, I think. At the end of those five minutes, you were required to turn in the, your scrap of paper with your perfect circle with your name on it. And then at the next session, she would hand it back to you with a letter grade. No. Yes. That's I mean, terrible. Like, it That's was traumatic. Horrible. It was so traumatic. It was That's extraordinarily demoralizing, um, especially when you're in like middle school, which is such a hard time in anyone's life, I think. Yeah. Right? So I really thought like, this is what it means to be an artist. Mm. You know, this is what art is. If you're going to perform art in any way, it's obviously going to be making a perfect circle and doing it as perfectly as possible. And um, you know, Jackie, we talked briefly before I think we hit record about being perfectionists, mm -hmm. type A people, recovering, yes. recovering perfectionists. I, I was always that perfectionist kid. And so as someone who was always striving to do as best a job as possible, this is what really disturbed me was that I felt like art was something that I couldn't try hard enough to do. I think I got like maybe a C or a C minus at the upper level of grades on my perfect circle, which was nowhere close to perfect. Most of the time I would get like a D and I think even an F sometimes. And that is just so awful if you're a type A person who's a young and impressionable child. So yeah. it was awful. And so that's, I think that really kind of pushed me over the edge to being like, there's no place for art in my life. Science Not is safe. Science yeah, is science safe. Is good. Like the comparison. Right, exactly. I can study and I can learn about science, but art is just beyond my abilities. So I had no interest in it. Not at all. And I remember one class in high school where a teacher briefly interrupted, and it was like a theology class. It was something totally random where the teacher interrupted one day's lesson to start showing a bunch of images of Edvard Munch. And I oh. remember being like, this is weird. And also, I kind of like it. It, it was yeah. a memorable, you know, memorable day of class. But again, no inkling that this would be what I would end up doing. So it was in college then that it happened. It was, and it was fairly accidental. You know, in my mind, I think I give it a lot of weight, but it is very true that I think that if you had changed any of these small elements that I would not be here. So, I, you know, fate, God, universe, whatever you want to call it, it found me in a very odd way, which was that when I was a freshman going into my freshman year in college, I wanted to get, you know, again, type A looking before my freshman year started looking at the graduation requirements and being like, okay, I'm going to get all of these out of the way now. And so that included the humanities requirements on my general BA list. And so I was like, well, great. I'm going to get that out of the way now so I can focus on all my science classes. But everything I wanted to do, you know, like great books. There was this awesome fairy tale and folklore class that everyone took at the mm -hmm. school that I was like, I need to do that. But everything was full. And so I kept registering and trying to register and trying to register and wasn't able to get in anywhere. So I was slightly panicked. So I went to see a course counselor on campus and she, and I always tell the story because she was so, obviously she did this every day. This was her job, but she was so relaxed and blase. And she was like, it's fine. We're going to find you a class. We'll register you. You'll be done today. No worries. Don't even think about it. And so she opened the course catalog, like the physical, actual, you know, I went to a public university in California. It was pretty, pretty sizable course catalog. And she started at the letter A and fairly quickly she was flipping through and she said, art history, tons of people take art history here. Let's just see if there's any room available. And so she went over to her computer, lo and behold, there's room available in this, you know, survey of ancient art to, I think like late medieval, early Renaissance. Nice. And I didn't even say anything. I just thought, you know, I pretty much thought she was going to be like, well, that's one option. Let's see what else is in there. And she went over and was like, clickety clack, you're, you're in. in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
And I just remember being shell shocked and being like, but I don't want this. <laughs> I don't want this at all. Um, but that was sort of the great karmic or cosmic twist was that it ended up being my absolutely favorite class that I never missed. It was awesome. And part of that was because I had a really great professor who made the content so engaging, right? It's always comes down to really great teachers. Mm -hmm. And um, that was kind of it. I very, very soon found that that was what I was thinking about in my off time, like the nerd that I am. And uh, a couple of years later, I made it official and I became an art history major. That was a really long blabby story about the origins of art gen, but um, I, I never, in my own mind, I'm never not surprised that I'm here, if that's a weird thing to say, but it's true. No, not weird at all. And that's amazing because it's like, it's very interesting. Some of the folks we interview on the podcast will say, I was that kid with the notebook, you know, sketching where all the other kids want to look and, you know, be like, what drawing did you do next? You know, that they would strive for. Yeah. Or you have the shy one. Oh, I did, but I didn't show anybody. And it was just like private. But a lot of them do have that art thing from, you know, from a young age. Yeah. Um, but it's really interesting to hear of folks that find art later, whether, I mean, you were still young, don't get me wrong. Yeah. Um, some even find it and they're already in their, you know, 60s and 70s before they arrive to it. So it's like, it's never too late to get into the art, but it's always right. interesting to see those through lines and how people end up with art anyways. It's true. So, and yeah. I always feel like even when I was in college and starting out getting interested in art, I would ask people in my courses, you know, like, sitting next to me in the lecture hall and I say, is this your first art history class? How did you get into it? And I was consistently surprised and jealous kind of that people would be like, oh no, I've been, my family is all artists and I've been reading art books since I was a kid. And the ones that always really blew my mind were people who said, oh no, I had art history classes in high school. And I was like, you did? That is amazing. I did not. Great. That was not even an option where I was. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, it's, it's amazing the different ways that people come into it. Because it's not your everyday, I mean, it is in a weird way being in the art world. It's not like a weird job, but some people treat it like it's weird. I don't know. Or right. not valid. Right. Ugh. No. <laughs> we talk about that exactly right, right there in the chest. Like <laughs> Frustration. I know. Yeah. I, think, Same. I think that's especially helpful for our listeners to hear too, because we have art professionals, artists, but also young listeners too, who maybe are in high school trying to figure out if they want to go to college, what they want to major. And so Absolutely. it is refreshing too, to hear you can have a completely clear idea in your head of what you want to do. And then things happen, interest change, and you can totally pivot. Um, so that's also a great refreshing origin story of of clearly very successful and fruitful career that you now have in the arts didn't necessarily start the way most people think you may originally start. Right. Um, but of course, after college and getting all that experience, you have been a contemporary curator for 13 years, which is very impressive. And we can probably do an entire episode just on your experience there. But as then a curator, you decide to start the Art Curious podcast. So how did that begin? Um, and I imagine it probably is related to that art history storytelling. So that's a lot of what you cover on the podcast as well. Yes, absolutely. Um, it began really as kind of a lark. It was something that I was just thinking about for fun. And it has a very specific moment that it came into my life. So I always tell this story in that I was working on an exhibition of a South African artist's work. His name is Vim Bota. I did this show. I think it came finally into fruition in 2019. Time is irrelevant. It makes no sense. But I was working on this exhibition and it usually took like three to four years for some shows to come from idea stage to full fruition. So it take a long, takes a long time. And so I was working with this artist to come up with his first exhibition in the U.S. And so part of that was that I was basically meeting him where he was at that point so that we could talk about the logistics of the show. And it just happened to be that he had an exhibition that was opening in the south of France. And so I was able to go over there mm -hmm. to see the show and to meet him in person and really be get, you know, get the ball rolling on our exhibition. And so I had to fly into Paris and then drive down to this tiny town. And so I had a couple of days built into my schedule where I was like, well, I'm flying into Paris. I'm going to go in early just so I can get acclimated, jet lag, the whole deal. So might as well hang out in some amazing museums for a couple of days while I'm there. And so I was literally on the plane flying over, just sort of brainstorming about like, oh, I want to go to this place and I want to go to this place. And of course I thought of the Louvre. I had been there one other time on one other trip to Paris like a decade before. And so the first thing I thought of when you think of the Louvre, it's like the Mona Lisa just pops in your mind. And I thought, well, that would be nice. I would like to see her again. I haven't seen her in a while. 
And that always brings me back. It's like this little mental jump ropes or uh, jumping stones. That doesn't make any sense. You know what I mean? <laughs> Stepping stones. <laughs> yep, yep. Um, I think the Louvre, I think Mona Lisa. And then anytime I thought the Mona Lisa, I think about being back as an undergrad taking these art history classes. And I had a professor who was completely 100% adamant that the Mona Lisa that you see on view at the Louvre is fake, mm -hmm. not real. And I remember when she told that story, she didn't spend a lot of time on it. It was just sort of like, well, I think that it's not real. And, you know, it's been stolen a few times. And so whatever, this is definitely a reproduction. So don't worry about it if you never make it to see her at the Louvre. Um, but I remember so just interesting. Some like so hot gossip, like a hot take. Oh, yeah. It was yeah. from this professor that I so, um, I mean, I practically worshiped her because she was so amazing. And I was just thinking like, what a weird conspiracy theory to believe, but she said, <laughs> yeah. she bought into it. So when you hear a really strange story from a professor that you respect so much, it sticks with you. And so I never forgot that she said that, but I also never really followed up on like, why would she even think that in the first place? So that's when the story sort of brewed in my mind. I said, I've got to do a little research about why she would possibly at all come up with this theory. And the more I started reading about the thefts, plural perhaps, of Mona Lisa beginning in 1911 and hearing the backstory and the things that were involved, how long the artwork was missing, the potential theories of the people who may or may not have been involved and how the story developed and changed over probably a good 20 to 30 years. Mm -hmm. The more I read about it, the more I was like, this is fascinating and so weird. And as someone, and, and granted, I've spent my time at the North Carolina Museum of Art specializing in contemporary art, but my background is more historical, what I lovingly call the old stuff. Uh, <laughs> but as an art historian and a curator, I did not know this story. And so I thought if I, as an art professional, don't know about this, then I there's got to be a lot of people out there who don't know about it. And what a weird, fun story. And I have been a podcast listener since I think I started listening in like 20. 2007, 2008 was like the first podcast that I started getting into. I always call them story time for grownups. And so I thought, well, doing a podcast, maybe that's how I will share this fun information. So it was very loosey goosey. I had no audio experience. Still feel like I have no audio experience. <laughs> I have a little bit more now that I've been into for seven years, but oh my gosh. Um, I, it was very much just a whim. It was something that I thought would be a fun side project to do. I had no anticipation that this would be something that I would still be doing seven years from now. I didn't think that far ahead. I just thought this will be fun. And if a handful of people who aren't my family or friends listen to this weird project that I'm doing on my own, bonus. Um, and that was it. It was very, very casual. So it's it's shocking that I am literally here speaking with you right now. I'm still surprised that um, I, it found an audience. Very weird. Very wonderful. Yeah. It is absolutely wonderful. And we were talking before we were recording on how Adriana and I have been listening since season one. And I think even Gosh. those tie-ins, as you were talking about with sitting, sitting in art history class, it can maybe have that cliche of being like the lecture hall and boring and going through slides. But there's always those strange stories that intrigue you. I feel like I had a very similar experience in um, art school to where they were talking about the rivals between two different artists. And so it'd be like, this artist would make this piece and then this one would use this element and then like one up them. And how basically these two artists were that you just see as, oh, they're different artists, they're making their things seeing those connections about, oh, this was like an attack on that one. Yeah. And that rivalry that really catapulted their careers. And then on your podcast, highlighting an entire series, you have a rival series or artists that fell in love series, or just all of these unknown stories to where they might not make it to the mass general lecture hall of art history 101. But those are the stories that make any subject matter interesting. Almost the equivalent of like, the modern gossip column of, oh, did you hear about, I don't know, Taylor Swift and this artist's songs going back and forth about their relationships? <laughs> and you're like, that makes it so much more interesting than so just, much. oh, here's a song and here's a song. <laughs> it's yeah. true. And I always tell people that if it requires, or not requires, but if it just takes that little bit of gossip, like you're saying, to get you interested in looking a little closer or learning a little bit more, maybe you'll be like, I heard about that one artist at one time on that one episode and an exhibition's coming to my, my town museum. I'm going to go check that out because I know this little tiny bit of information. For me, that is just bonus. That is gravy. And that's what I want. I want it to be an interesting story. I hope that it will sit on its own, but that if it gets you to lean in a little bit more into learning about these artists and their works, then I mean, 
wow, I can't ask for more than that, really. Yeah. And there's a secondary element. I feel like one of them, of course, being the educational, like you mentioned, right? Like it'll get you interested, help demystify a little bit, which we love that idea of number one, they're human too. So they have the same drama that we do, you know, same struggles, same fears, same dreams, uh, even if they were 500 years ago. So there's that tie-in, which is fantastic. But then I think the secondary element, not just the educational, but also like realization for those folks that are either artists or aspiring artists to be like, wait, hold on, this person was able to make it. Um, and you're basically breaking some of these preconceived notions that may have come down through, you know, popular culture or whatever, just misinformation in general. Um, like, for example, one that I'll bring up is like, you've talked about Vinny. I like to call him Vinny, Vincent. Yeah. Um, and the whole thing like, oh, he's never sold any work. And you're like, actually, tan, 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 tan. Also, he traded, you know, like, doesn't that count too? You know, if he traded, you know, a painting for wine and bread. I mean, if he got money and turned around and bought wine and bread, isn't it the same thing? Like, That's a good point. Exactly. So it's like bringing these things into, you know, more information. Also, how these artists with way more limited resources that we have now, because now, of course, with the internet and technology, like we can get in front of millions of people, um, yeah. as opposed to, oh, you were stuck in the small town in the south of France, and only the 50 people in like the center of the town knew about you and everybody else thought you were nuts. And would avoid you like, it was so different and it's like but you still could make it and make a living or at least attempt to make a living and your history and your legacy persist after all these years it's like any any younger artist that now might be like well i didn't make it into tiktok when it was first hot life's over etc it's like actually no like <laughs> there, you can still make it like there's so much to look into and it's like i don't know it's almost like they act as role models in a way that's such in history a great to do point. it yeah if they i really love it. that perspective yeah but it's true because i think there's this perspective that some people have that artists and also i think art professionals in general it's like you're in a different category of people, mm -hmm. but we're all still people. We still yep. struggle. By no means does this, I, I think these um, historical figures show that it's easy. I think a lot of them are extremely hard workers. I mean, talking about Vinny right there. I mean, <laughs> this is a guy and I mean, granted, he had some mental issues mm -hmm. going on and, and we could talk about that at a different point for sure. But this is somebody who worked incredibly hard during an incredibly short period of his life. Talk about a pivot. That guy mm -hmm. massively pivoted a couple of times in his <laughs> life. But I think a lot of these people, we we ultimately think of them as like, you know, geniuses who were born with massive skill. And sometimes that's true. But I would say that most of the time it's not. It's just a lot of hard work. And that's definitely something that I think I like to pull out of these stories about artists is that they toil, they struggle, they get lucky sometimes with their work, and sometimes they don't. And it's crazy how many people ultimately just come at it uh, really just as a career and something that they work on and toil on for their whole lives. Um, yeah, yeah, it's not all just being born lucky and talented <laughs> and rich, which yeah. also I get that a lot as an art historian too, where people will be like, when I was in college, people would say, oh, you're an art history major. They would first back up and be like, well, are you an artist? And I'd have to say like, sadly, no, I'm not an artist. <laughs> then people would automatically be like, oh, well, you must be rich because no one would major in art history unless you already have like a trust fund from daddy. And I was like, no, oh, no, <laughs> no, oh. I, I don't. Um, yeah. So it's, it's interesting. I, I like to push back against those generalities about the art yeah. in general as much as possible because yeah. we're normal people talking right now normal people who are making things work out within this realm yeah absolutely and quick detour before I ask the next question is um you just reminded me one of the interviews we did not long ago uh was Amanda Maples and oh. uh, uh Sean Richards like yes. this couple and she is a curator and yeah. he paints but also bartends and like it was so helpful to hear them talk about like this is a career there's oh. certain sacrifices you must make or certain changes but you can do it like like we're normal folk too you might see us on the street and have no idea and we're not like hoity-toity people either like they look so oh, normal uh, they're, awesome. I mean, they're so fun and so nice and I don't know like it's one of those things so it's helpful obviously you're taking the more historical side but 
uh, Jackie and I attempt, of course, but <laughs> some of the living ones um, to also help with that. So I think that's, you know, that's the crossroads of our, our podcast. And I think that's, that's part of how we give back is to, to help, not just like I said, educational, but also for those artists or aspiring artists to be like, oh, wait, I, I can, there, there's different ways, but um, you're doing a massive, a massive favor because for, for right and wrong, I think it, it's both of uh, the art world gets such a bad rap as being a really in exclusive place, I would say. And so it's it's something that, again, it's like people think that you have to come at it from one perspective and one direction sometime, and that is patently false. And so I think you having this conversation with people and bringing them on to share their different paths can only help, really, to get people interested. Right. Fingers crossed. But I, I can see there's there's been so many actual centuries of people being excluded from thinking that this is a possibility for them. So thank you for what you're doing. It's huge. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you course. for what you're doing as well. <laughs> yeah. And that's one of our go-to mottos. Um, it's just that community over competition mindset yes. and showing artists that you define and success is different than another, their path getting there, but then also that rising tides lifts all shit mindset. So by, um, sharing the stories of other artists, seeing how they do it, just sharing forward that advice. It really is so helpful because we've been so blessed to have so many artists share tips and tricks with us. We're like, man, I wish I could be a fly on the wall for this conversation like three years ago. Yeah. So now both of us having artists or studios at, down at Art Space, we're like, how can we share these conversations that we're having with like our past selves, so to speak, that are working in our studios and just craving this information because it's out there and artists are so generous. It's that, true. And yeah. if I can just take 30 seconds to say like North Carolina, Central North Carolina artist communities, I've lived in a couple different places throughout my life. This is an amazing place for mm -hmm. an amazing group and community. I have never seen a community that's so um, supportive of one another. So hats off, North Carolina, you rule. <laughs> Place for North Carolina. <laughs> um, but uh, I did want to ask you, Jennifer. So, okay. So the three of us, you know, we, we do podcasts, of course. We've just established that. It's a service back to our community, of course. Um, but I do want to ask you, what was that pivotal moment when you realized I'm having fun with the podcast? I want to pause the curatorial you know, career and just do that switch, like do the podcast, do writing full time, you know, work on a book and everything else. What was that pivotal, pivotal moment like? I, you know, it's really funny when I was thinking about this question, I'm not sure there was one single moment. I think it was a, a couple of years of just having it be in the back of my brain. And honestly, a lot of crying. Like, I don't want to make it seem like this was an easy choice for sure. Um, because it was my dream job and I achieved my dream. And that can be very weird ultimately in that you feel uh, so, so thankful and so humbled that you're able to do what you wanted. I set out to be a curator. I became a curator. And then you step back and you're like, well, now what's my next goal? And sometimes that can be not only extraordinarily intimidating, but it can be really, you feel guilty to be like, well, I worked so hard to get this thing. And now I'm considering giving it up. Like, what is wrong with you? So it honestly ultimately came down to the fact that the curatorial job was my typical 40 hour a week job, but the podcast, especially, and I think both of you can probably relate to this as well. It's a lot of work. Yes. It's hard. <laughs> um, oh my gosh. It, it is. I really thought like, this will be easy. I'll just talk into a microphone and then la la magic will happen and it'll go out in the world. It'll only take me 40 minutes a week because it's a 40 minute episode. And you're like, exactly. <laughs> Imagine if that was the case. We'd be releasing episodes every day. But... Totally. It'd be like cut to me sad in front of my computer eight days later being like, why can't I make this work? Uh, <laughs> my gosh, it's so much work. And I, I, you know, I'm jealous of you guys in many ways that you're able to just have conversations that are lovely because I script everything again, for better or for worse. It's just because that's how my brain works. So essentially when I'm in season, I'm writing to me what I describe as like a 10 to 15 page term paper every wow. couple of weeks. I, I do have researchers who help out occasionally and sort of, you know, like help me at least get the basics of somebody's life down in bullet points. But it's still just a massive amount of work, even in the post-production side of things where you're talking about editing and, and getting it out into the world, promoting it. It's its own full-time job. So ultimately, there really became this time where I was like, I'm really tired. I'm 
having fun doing this, but it is a lot. And my job is a lot. And I, you know, I, I never want to be like, <sighs> it's hard because I also want to just point out that like, I had a very young child at the point. I started the Art Curious podcast in 2016. My son was one year old. So again, I never meant for this to really grow to how it, I, I did not think this is, this is the bottom line. Everyone, Jen Dassel did not think. She did not think about anything. I was just going by the seat of my pants and hoping for the best. Um, and ultimately, that was the decision I made was I would like to probably focus on one thing. I want it to be either my full-time job or the podcast. And especially after 2020, when I was able to have my first book published, I thought, you know, and I think this is this is a good time to do it. Fine. So it ultimately was just, you know, a few years of sort of dwelling on it and feeling tired. Um, yeah, yeah. And that makes sense. Cause it's also too, like, you know, with a kiddo, then that additional flexibility, if you're curating, I'm sure some of it can be done remotely, but a lot of it is on site boots on the ground versus sure. at least with a podcast and writing a book, you're in charge of your own schedule. Well, maybe yes. your kid's in charge of your schedule too, but you know what I mean? It's a collaboration. Let's call it that. <laughs> when they need appointments and different things. Um, but that makes a lot of sense too. It's like, you paid your dues, or at least that's how I like to think about it. I did corporate finance for 13 years and before making the switch. So I'm like, oh yeah, I went through that and um, I'm going to give this other thing a try. Yeah. And um, worst case scenario, not burning any bridges, you know, we can, we can walk back and be like, hey, so, but I have to give this a try. Like, this is the time. Yes. So I, I feel like, you know, from what you're saying that that echoes, like sometimes it's like the signs are blinking, like, do yeah. it now, try it now. Um, it's not the end of the world. You can go back, even if it's yeah. a different institution or a different company in my case, like totally. that experience you've accumulated over those 13 years, which is also how long I was in corporate. It doesn't go away. It's, no. still, it's still there. And a lot of skills, I think people sometimes forget that skills are transferable, right? Mm -hmm. like just oh, yes. Because oh, yes. I, there's so much that there is overlap in so many ways, but I just want to just, you know, back you up and, and, praise you for taking those leaps because I think a lot of people, I was certainly really scared. I probably could have and maybe should have left the curatorial job a little bit earlier. Um, but it's a very scary thing to consider mm -hmm. because it is it is taking a risk to a degree. But if there's one thing that I would love to do, I would love to support people and tell them that it's okay to contemplate, let alone to do it, because I feel like I would have regretted it not giving it a shot. And it might last for another year. It might last for 10 years. I don't know what the future holds, but I'm glad that I'm trying it out, you know, because it's it's worth giving it a shot, especially when it's something you're so passionate about. Absolutely. And I mean, the quality of your podcast in general shows, and it's no surprise that it takes you so long on the back end, the part that people don't see, um, because for others who have listened to your podcast, it really it almost feels like a cinematic experience in a way with like your music that you bring in and the transitions. And it is clearly research. And especially even thinking back to your first season, I remember that's how I would always like when I was sending it to all of my friends from college, be like, it reminds me of like a super interesting, thoughtful, like research paper of like the art history stories you actually want to listen to. And right. over the years, of course, having multiple series, as we've already talked about, but from that time management, you you did have that full-time curatorial job and then it becomes a full-time podcasting job. Right. Which we talk about a lot as well. Do it until it feels like it's not worth it anymore. And then you kind of have to make a decision because exactly. it can feel like a leap of faith, but since you focused so much on quality from the beginning, hopefully that was an easy catapult into the world of entrepreneurship that many of us have. Yeah. I mean, I hope so. I feel still in many cases, like I'm just kind of chugging along or, or struggling to find the next direction. But the thing that I constantly am trying to remember myself that I hope is helpful for other people too, is, is kind of what we were just talking about with the transference of skills. It's the same thing in that what you're doing now build, it builds upon what you already have done and what you've already learned and experienced, but what you're doing right now will also hopefully be leading you to whatever is next too. So I try to keep that in perspective and hope that, you know, it's all, it's all hopefully good. And we'll all hopefully continue to bring good things into your lives. So absolutely. Um, every job, every experience, every project, whether school project, professional side gig, they're all just skills that you're adding to your tool belt. And yeah. you don't realize, oh man, I'm really glad I did this one side project five years ago, because now I am using it in this new project I never could have dreamed of. And um, they all kind of build on each other. But yeah. of course, when you're in those phases where you're balancing multiple hats, so to speak, curator, podcast host, author, 
mom, friend, all these different labels that we all have. Um, how do you stay organized with the things that you have to do and managing your time? For, for those who aren't watching this on YouTube, it's like me putting my head down <laughs> or like into my hands. Um, I wish that I had like a secret recipe for you. I think it all really, I mean, really, especially when I was still at the museum, it was a lot of bleed over so that I, when I would take, you know, like I would take 15 minutes and instead of going and standing at the coffee machine and sadly, instead of going to talk to a friend at the opposite cubicle, I would be then using that time to research really quickly and to try to figure out, you know, my next book that I was going to get from the library to talk about whatever I was writing about that day. It was a lot of extra time. So I would wake up early and I would go to bed late. And so I would use those times when I weren't, you know, when I wasn't at the museum or I wasn't putting my son to sleep or making dinner or whatever. That was when I would work on the podcast. So it was, especially for those first couple of years, it was a lot of time that I should have been resting that I wasn't. So it was toil for sure. It was a lot of extra work. The only ways that I really could stay organized was that I have to say I, I'm a bullet journal person. So type A, it, it fits. It all fits together. That fits. Um, it, it tracks hard. Um, <laughs> but I also want to say, like, do I have it together? I mean, no. And I'm trying my best. But I feel like every few weeks, you'll find me Googling something that somebody told me that was like, this is my hack for making everything work. And that I'm constantly looking up weird programs and apps that, you know, have been promised to me as the thing that will solve my problems. Nothing has worked quite yet. It's just a, a constant struggle. Um, but yeah, I'm a pen and paper person. So I'm constantly making lists of things just so I don't forget them that I need to take care of. And that works with the podcast too. I have a checklist that I print for every single episode just so I don't forget to do something as minor as like making the video, audio only video version of my show after and putting it on YouTube. Everything, if I don't have it on paper, it's just like, it's gone. Because I'm usually in the process of doing multiple episodes at once when I'm in season and when I'm off season, because I will be in the early phases of jotting down ideas and sort of like, you know, outlining the episode as I'm writing another episode, as I'm in the process of recording and editing the third episode and while I'm promoting a fourth. So I feel like I'm constantly juggling just because of the way the time schedule works out. And again, I've mentioned before to you, like, I'm jealous of so much of what you do. I'm jealous that you work together. You have two people. This is amazing. And I highly support this because we've talked about it. it's a lot of work. And so being able to split between a couple people is huge. I'm very lucky in that my husband is actually my producer. So all of your, your work, um, you're talking about this kind of cinematic quality, that's all due to him. So thank you. <laughs> well, thank kudos you. to that. <laughs> but like, it's nice to be able to have people that you can fall back on. Um, at the very beginning of the podcast for the first year and a half, I think I edited my own show. And so having one less thing on my to-do list is gigantic. So yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Having a partner in crime here is definitely helpful. We've talked about the podcast before, but we definitely, I think, play to each other's strengths of okay, you're really good at this. I'm really good at this, how we can lean on each other and being such good creative collaborators on projects like the podcast and friends first is so helpful. Of, But yeah, we love being able to lean on each other to then share the voices of artists and art historians and art professionals that we admire to catapult their stories into new ears of artists and studios at their home studios or wherever they are across the country, which is so fun. Support but highly. Yes. But it sounds like from a time management standpoint too, talking about earlier, like skills in your tool belt, it sounds like how you manage the podcast now is kind of similar to your long-term curatorial deadlines that you were talking about of, oh, this is going to be a five-year long exhibition that I'm planning, but also executing what I planned three years ago. Now it's maybe just, okay, two months from now, this is going to air, but I'm recording tomorrow for this other one. Absolutely. And I think it, just for anybody who's listening who might be interested in a curatorial career or a museum career, I think that's something that's really interesting and something that's helpful to know in that, of course, it varies based on the size of the institution that you're working with. But a lot of this does all come down to these long lead times and to organizational skills and management. Luckily, at the North Carolina Museum of Art, you know, we were a fairly I mean, technically, we're a mid-sized museum there. I still call it we, even though I haven't worked there for a year and a half. It's 
I still feel mentally a part of it in many ways. But, um, you know, there's other people who can lift the load and carry things. So when you're organizing an exhibition, you have an exhibition manager or a director of exhibitions or both to help carry those things with you. But it is a lot. I think a lot of people sort of imagine that curators, it's like we waltz into a museum and we stand and we go like, "Mm," and stare (laughs) meaningfully at works of art and, you know, I mean, I guess there is probably a little bit of that to a degree, but mostly I always tell people like I sat at my desk a lot with Excel open, copying in information from a database of artwork to be like, okay, I want to include this painting. So now I've got to do all of the, the admin. There's a lot, it's a lot less glamorous for sure than people think. So it's the same thing with podcasting, to be honest. That's okay. <laughs> That's totally Okay. <laughs> It's part of it. And I think there's a parallel too for artists, anybody that's working on large scale projects, it's the same way. Some of the folks we've talked to on the podcast do either public art or they do commercial work, like, you know, art in buildings with developers and things like that, or muralists. And they're they're facing some of the same things. They're like, I have to wait till the building lobby is finally constructed before I can go in, before the floor goes in. Uh, But after the walls are up and they're finished, so they're also working with these long deadlines and different milestones in them that can also shift around and it's completely outside of their control. Um, So they also have to juggle um, so yeah, yeah, there, there's definitely parallels on, you know, in the art world. If you're just making your work in your studio and then go, da da, come buy it, that's yeah. different. But if you're working <laughs> on longer term projects, you're going to be facing a lot of the same things of like, okay, which thing has to go now, which meeting needs to be prioritized over which one, which project am I going to set the date for to complete first. So definitely it's- a lot of that, definitely a lot of parallels, but that also applies to us on the podcasting world as well. It's like, right. which part do we have this? Do we have the headshot? Do we have that image? Do we have the audio? It's so true. There's a it's lot a of lot. things to manage for sure. Yeah. And also yeah. I think um, something that a lot of artists I think is difficult, but but is equally important is, you know, budgeting and the business, the business work side of things like the paperwork that you have to do, mm-hmm. all of that stuff. It's not as fun for sure. And it's definitely not as glamorous as like being in your studio and actually making work, but it's also all part and parcel of it. But there's, it's again, all those transferable skills. It's uh, once you learn it, it's then something that you can apply and improve at. And it can only help, I think, your process, hopefully. Yeah, yeah, that, that's the program I'm glad I went to business school, not art school, and then did corporate, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. It, it definitely applies because it's a self-supporting artist. It's like you are a small business owner, let yourself yeah. as a podcast and author, you're small business it's- owner, you too, Jackie, of course. So Absolutely. that that's definitely us. Um, okay, uh, so just to give us a, a quick, a quick view, bird's eye view, um, what does your schedule look like? What's a typical week look like for you? And you know, you talked to us a little bit about organizing your time, but just trying to get a rough idea. Is the podcast like an everyday thing every few days? Like Ooh, writing I, on the book? Do you write yeah. every week for the book? <laughs> oh my gosh. I I probably hate to admit that right now my scoot my schedule is so like all over the place. <laughs> And I usually try to schedule, you know, talks like this or or phone calls or meetings that I might have. I try to schedule on a couple different days a week so that I can have at least one day a week that's totally clear where there's no expectations of me needing to be anywhere or be on a phone. And so that is what the days that I specifically bookmark for writing. Um, I have learned especially recently that it is easier for me to get work done and be out of the house. So that's something that has helped me recently is um, just kind of picking up and going to whatever coffee shop sparks my imagination that day. Um, But I very much, uh, I think the pandemic for better or for worse, again, (laughs) sort of threw a wrench in everything because I used to be really good at getting up at a particular time and setting an alarm. And this is a conversation I literally had this morning with my husband and was like, (laughs) I need to start getting more organized and setting an alarm because I think working from home And because I have been doing it even before I left the museum, because of the pandemic, we were all remote for a very long time. So I really have gotten kind of lazy about Uh stuff. So, and then, you know, I I lean into the mom thing a little bit. So then I'll be like, well, I have to do drop off. And so I I don't need to be upstairs at my computer (laughs) until at least 10, because I'm going to have to have breakfast. And I, yeah, it's bad is what I'm saying. So I need to be better. Um, Work in progress. Yes, work in progress. Uh, I'm making it work, but for sure I I can improve. That would be great. But no, I I think for a while I was trying to be very 
granular about stuff. So I, I actually did one of those Google calendars where I had it down to every 15 minutes where I was like from 10 o'clock until 11, I'm working on admin stuff and I'm answering emails at this time and I'm only doing writing. And then I have a 15 minute break for a snack. And I tried that. That doesn't work for me. Strangely. Really yeah, yeah. It's so rigid. Um, it, I thought that maybe the rigidity would be really good for me as a type A person. Mm. It backfired hard. So I try to do as much batching of projects as possible <laughs> so that I can kind of focus my mind on one type of work, if that makes any sense. Uh, so like I would be working on creating images for social media for two months at one time. So that'll be my project for the day. Uh, so sometimes just working on things like that is helpful. But no, I I wish that I could <laughs> tell you that I had some sort of amazing schedule where I have it all figured out. So, and you know what? I got to say, some days I wake up and I'm just like, it's a benefit and a, a I think a liability of working for yourself in that some days I'm just like, I can't do it today. I'm not today. Yeah. It. And I... Okay. I feel really bad about that sometimes, but I have some very supportive friends who remind me that no matter what you do and what your job is and what your life is like, that sometimes you need to have that flexibility to say to yourself, like, it's okay. Don't do anything today. You just need to watch old episodes of Gilmore Girls for five hours. And that's your job that yes. day. Yes, sign that's me okay. up. I know, right? Yeah, but we appreciate your honesty with that because I think that's that's a common thread, honestly, that we talk to with creatives, that especially the entrepreneurial creatives that are taking their projects full time is relearning what time management looks like for them. Because especially yeah. if you start in corporate world or even anywhere where you're told what your schedule is, you say, okay, well, you have to be here by 9 a.m. and you have to sit in this chair or be in this building until 5 p.m. And so on the days where maybe it's questionable how motivated you are, like you're forced to do it. Or on the days where you are super motivated, that's great. But you're also told, well, you have to be at this meeting at this time, this meeting at that. And so then when you have the total freedom, it does require a lot of discipline, but also like empathy and understanding as a creative, which makes it hard to balance. It's the type A entrepreneurial planning, but also we are creatives and they can tell when, or you can tell when you may be painting and you're not in the flow or writing when yeah. you're not in the flow. Cause you, we ultimately are creating a product in a way that we're sharing with the world. Um, and so that's honestly a common thread that we find. It's what does that flow look like? Is it more rigid or is it more organic go with the flow or kind of a combination of the two ever fluctuating depending on the season of life that you're in? Right. And I want, I want people to feel like hopefully they have the freedom to see what works best for them and experiment with that. Because I, again, like as a type A person, I would have never thought that being a little laissez-faire with my own schedule was a good idea. I, I mean, I guess maybe it might not be, but, um, but yeah. I think just giving yourself the space to see and to come up with whatever's going to work best for you. Uh, that's a privilege for sure, but it doesn't mean that it's easy, but I, I, again, it's all that like self-care and learning to be gentle with yourself, especially if you're just starting out that entrepreneurial journey. Uh, I think that's really important. Absolutely. And so now, Looking back a little bit to when you were balancing both projects, curatorial work and your podcast, um, do you have any advice for someone who maybe is balancing a full-time job with a side hustle or passion project that they want to make full-time one day? I have a couple of things. First is something that we just talked about, which is give yourself breathing room, give yourself grace and give yourself permission to step back on some of those days and be like, I just, I'm not doing it today. I can't do it. And part of that is reach is I think my second point, which is that just be careful of burnout because this is something that I have struggled with and that I am sort of to a degree, honestly, struggling with right now because it's a lot, especially if you're doing it on your own. It's a lot to manage. And for people who might be the kind who are prone to anxiety or to dwelling on things, I raising my hand, I am part of this in that it's like even when I'm off work. I'm still thinking about work all the time. And so my brain can get taxed very easily. So I think that's something that I never really had to consider when I was in that nine to five job and I was told where to be and when to be. And then at the end of the day, I would leave the space and then I would be like, okay, sure. There were days where I would still be thinking about work, but it's not the same as when it is your, you know, your baby that you are striving to make happen and bring out into the world. It's a different perspective, at least in my case. So I just want people to <laughs> just to take care of themselves because it's really hard. That's really hard to do for anyone, period, I think, is putting yourself first, especially when you're getting started with a, a new project. Um, so just take care. 
take care of yourselves. You're more important than everything, anything, you know, so people, yeah. people first. Absolutely yeah. love that. And that reminds me of, you know, an important lesson that I learned in corporate, but it actually applies even more as a self-employed person. And it's that idea of you stop when the train leaves the station. So essential, I'm dead serious. Like I had to work through this because I think art 24 seven, essentially yes. like I look like I can be outside and there's a tree and I'm like, oh, there's the abstract shapes in between the branches of the tree. I should grab a notebook or the iPad and start sketching them out because they'll, they'll show up in a painting later. Right. But yeah. it's like, you know, I could be at a restaurant on a date with my husband and I'm like, oh, look at this color of the tablecloth that these, like, it can be the most random things. My, my brain's always like, collecting information like for future yeah. artwork right or ideas yeah. for new series and things so it's really hard for me to turn the art brain off it because it's awesome. such an integrated part of what I do and it's permeated everything in my life so I'm like go to a museum or go to the gym with a friend <laughs> museum like you know what I mean it's like it's so many of the decisions in my life revolve about you know the, the art you know, my art world, right? Not capital A art world, my personal art world. So um, I had to learn because it's very easy for me to go into workaholic mode and work. And I have, to, I have to track my time. Anybody who's heard our podcast has heard me talk about Clockify and tracking time um, because otherwise I can be like, oh, look, I worked 70 hours this week. And that's not a badge of honor, by the way, that, and, and I'm going to give myself grace. Maybe there were special events or things that happened but I don't want to burn out and I know it's not sustainable. And I know as a business owner, small business owner, first three to five years of establishing yourself, there's going to be a lot of hustle involved, but you also have to put in things in place, uh, different mechanisms, if you will, or systems to say, okay, once I reach a certain number of hours a week, that train has left the station. We're done. Go watch Netflix, go outside and play with the dog, go out to the park, go talk to that friend you haven't talked to in a few months, but no more work. Uh, and if you can't separate art for fun for art for work, then you literally need to stop and turn that off because yeah. you're going to, you're going to burn out. And then it takes so much longer to recover than if you did it a little earlier on, recognize what was happening, paused it, recovered self, you know, self care, a little healing, little yeah. recovery, and then came back. But yes, I, it always comes up oh, to me you. and maybe it'll be helpful for you to our listeners. When you get to that point, you're like, nope, train has left the station. I think that's so good. I love that yeah. metaphor. And I think you're going to, that's helping me because now <laughs> that is like a mental reminder too. But I think it's really hard for everyone in so many ways, because we're all being torn in like 80 different directions yes. at any given moment. But I think it's also really hard, especially if you are transitioning from having multiple career paths or multiple mm -hmm. things at once. So if you have a full-time job and a side hustle and you're trying to leverage their side hustle and starting new, I feel like it's extra hard because that workaholic mode by that point for a lot of people, at least in my case, it's built in because mm -hmm. it's like me talking about the fact that I would wake up early and I would use every lunch break. I would not sit with my wonderful coworkers at a beautiful table outdoors and enjoy a lunch break. I was using my lunch break to write. I was using my lunch break to go run as many errands as possible. So I was constantly working and that is so hard. So being able to train yourself the opposite direction, to train yourself to take breaks and to stop when, you leave, when the train leaves, that yeah. is a gigantic life skill and one that is only helpful. And that yeah. only helps you and everybody around you I'm trying to set that example for my son. It is hard, yep. but you know, it's like, that can only be a good thing for people yeah. to learn. Yeah, it really so hard. Cause when I was doing art while doing corporate, I would wake up earlier to paint before going to work. Yeah. Lunchtime, I would go to one of the galleries in, <laughs> and I was in North Raleigh. So I would go to one of the galleries in the area and go check yeah. out the new work, new exhibitions, whatever. Again, instead of talking to my coworkers or even after work, it's like, oh, there's a first Friday. Um, yeah. So definitely relate with all that. But um, <laughs> I do want to reel it back in because obviously we can talk about this for a while. But yes, <laughs> sorry, when the train sorry, leaves sorry. the station, Y'all decide what that looks like, how many hours a day or a week, but important to set that in place. But um, one of the questions we like to ask all our guests um, is how do you define success as an artist? Now, of course, your it's your view is going to be a little bit different instead of a practicing artist, more than more than that, someone that talks about artists, research artists, interacts with artists. So we were interested in seeing your view. How would you define it? I want to be very loose about it and be like success. If you're bringing, you know, if, if you're finding joy in what you're doing, to me, that's success. If you're finding any sort of personal appreciation or pleasure in what you're doing, that that should be 
a nice standard in and of itself. But I know that also outside gratification is, is important too, because that can help motivate. I would say for me personally, the things that have meant the most to me over time are the occasional emails or comments on social media or something that people will approach me, sometimes even in person, if they see me somewhere, and they tell me that they had no interest in art and that they listened to an episode and now it's become something that has changed in their lives. So I have, and it's still like so mind blowing and humbling to me that I have had at least a dozen people write me over the past few years to tell me that they've changed their major from whatever they were studying to learning to become an artist or an art historian or people who've come up to me and said that they decided to go back to grad school to learn about art. Uh, so it, it's crazy to me, but um, being able to feel like I am helping people find that joy and a new passion or a new direction is is huge. And especially as we mentioned, um, the art world can feel really off limits to so many people. It again, I, I think you mentioned this, Adriana, that the a lot of people think that it's just not a necessary or important part of society to be a creative person. It's so, almost like people think of it as very superfluous, mm -hmm. which is absolutely not true, by the way. I <laughs> just <laughs> preach into the choir for sure. But um, but I think sometimes it's nice to feel like if there's anything that I can do to make somebody feel like that's a course for them, then for me, this is it's all worthwhile. <laughs> for sure. Absolutely. And now looking back to when you first had that college experience intrigue of art history, what is one piece of advice you wish you had heard before you got started on your journey as a creative professional? Oh my gosh. I think I just would like somebody to say, Ugh. Maybe maybe not try so hard is part of it, but also just have fun and try things that might not make any sense for you because, you know, being open to what, and I, it sounds so woo woo to be like what the universe brings you but this is my lived experience you guys it's like um being open to just the things that you think might not be for you that also end up changing your life in in as much as the ones that you actively pursue so i wish that i could go back to being that freshman self in college and just looking at a weird schedule of classes and being like hmm that's so weird i probably will hate it but i wonder if i might like it i'm just going to register in it so i just want people to feel like they have the ability to try things and that failure is always an option and it's not always a bad thing and just have fun because man, life is short and I want everybody. It, it's so lame. I just want to be like, I just want you to be happy. It's the mom <laughs> in me. I want to mom everybody and just be like, are you having fun? Good. <laughs> no, not lame at all. Not lame at all. If more people were happier, there would be a lot of less bad, th bad things in this universe. I'm just going to throw it out there and not going to unpack that right now. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that one's a longer, that's that's a whole other episode. Yeah, um, conversation for sure. Yep. Yep. And how art can help in that. But um, if someone were to randomly hand you a hundred bucks, what would you splurge it on or invest in? It has to be something that brings you joy and relates to your work as a creative professional. Oh my gosh. This is kind of podcast related. Uh, okay. I was going to be like, oh, can I buy some more plants? Like I'm not very good with plants, but I want to be good with plants. Um, oh gosh. I'm also one of those people that I have a problem when it comes to stationary stores. So I have Ooh. a whole box of notebooks that I've had forever and I just keep buying them. So I would probably end up buying some sort of really fancy notebook that I would never use and just stack it in the box, but it would be beautiful. And I would look at it. And so it would make me happy. There you okay, go. There, another one. one. <laughs> yeah. Or another one could be for books, art books, right? True. Yeah. True. I mean, there's some excellent ones you've recommended on the podcast. I know. So and that's, I feel, that's a splurge. Here's, here's where I have to sometimes slap myself and be like, okay, stop right now. Because sometimes, especially after having written a book, people send you books all the time. So now I'm on the publisher's list where they're like, this woman wrote a book. So she knows about art. And then she talks about other books and recommends them on her podcast. So the amount of free books, art books I get is stunning. And every once in a while, I'll open the mailbox and I'll be like, oh, there's another book. And I just want to be like, shut up, me. You're getting free books, free art books. I was about to say, maybe we need to write a book so that we can get free books. Oh my gosh. Uh -huh. We'll put that on our list of goals. Pass mine off to you. Ooh, <laughs> oh, I have a better oh one. Don't art me. book club. Art <gasps> book club. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, sign me up. I am there. Okay. okay. The line. Well, <laughs> We'll have to discuss. Add it to our list of things to do. We're, none of us have anything going on. No, it's fine. New podcast idea. <laughs> Art 
book club. That would be really fun though. That I'm serious. Fun. I, yeah. would, I, would, I, would, I would be happy to do that with you. <laughs> well, love the workshop this. I know. I'm like, yeah, we need to have a brainstorm session and, and bring a few other people that also podcast and be like, can we take turns? Because obviously editing takes a while, but can yeah. we take turns doing this? Anyways. We so will continue fun. the conversation offline, of course. Um, we will make no promises on this uh, on this recording, um, <laughs> but keep your eyes. Out. But speaking of books, speaking of books, um, your new book. I mean, you're you're working on it. Are you finished? Is it close? Is it an editing world? So and you're willing to share? Yes. So <laughs> it is. Um, it's very different here. I'll give you a couple tidbits. It's very different from Art Curious. Art Curious was basically an extension of the podcast. So it was twelve chapters, and each chapter was its own little individual story and tidbit. This book is one story, so it's a lot of work. Um. So I am. I got the book deal last year. I spent the whole year. Um, thank you. I spent the whole year researching. And so I am now, and I think about it two months ago, I started actively in the writing phase. I have another year to finish it. So by next, like March, April, it is due to my editor, and then it will come out in 2025. So that sounds like a million years from now, um, but it's not. It's going to happen pretty fast. So I'm I'm deep in it right now. Um, and yeah, it's a it's wonderful and it's kicking my butt at the same time. So it's uh it's real, you guys. It's real. Oh, well, that is so exciting. And as we've talked about, once you reverse engineer those timelines into shorter things that have to get done, again, it sounds like, oh, that's like two years from now, but the small deadlines add up and the urgency begins. So we're so excited to get our hands on it, but not oh. rushing you by any means. <laughs> no worries, no worries. I know I'm I'm excited to get there myself. So it's it's been a lot of fun. And again, it's one of those moments that you have to step back and I have to be grateful and appreciative. It is a lot of work to write a book. Oh my gosh. But yeah. also, um, you know, again, what a privilege that I have the opportunity to do this because it's, it's, it's nice. Oh, absolutely. And it has been such a privilege to be able to talk to you today. Thank you so much for all the insight and stories that you share with us and our listeners and for our listeners who want to stay connected with you and invest in your future book. How can they stay in contact with you after they listen to today's episode? You can find me at artcuriouspodcast.com or artcuriousmedia.com. Um, I'm also on Instagram, at least for the, the time being, doing that thing. So I'm at artcuriouspod. And uh, I answer and read every single email that comes my way so people can easily find me on my website as well. So artcuriouspodcast.com is the best way to find me. And then Art Curious is on all your, uh, all your podcasty places. Perfect. Well, we'll be sure to link all those things in the show notes. Also, we would love it uh, if you would stay with us a few extra minutes so we can discuss uh, building an artist's reputation for the bonus segment for our podcast supporters. Happy to do so. Awesome. So for our listeners, if you want to become a podcast supporter, head on over to leveluppartist.com to find out how you too can support the Level Up Artist podcast. And if you want to stay connected with us in between episodes and share what you have learned, you can follow us on social media. I'm at May Art across all platforms. And I'm at J Sander Studio on all platforms. And if you want to follow the podcast, we are at Level Up Artists on Instagram. Thank you so much for listening. We'll talk to you next week.